This conference Hi. will now be recorded. Hi, it's Dr. Wickline. I'm here to go over the uh, total joint conference and we'll just go ahead and get started here. So uh, as part of the protocol that I use, we use a company called Swift Path. They really helped us uh, codify and um, create a great booklet, a great pamphlet to help you get through this. And I think the biggest uh, piece of the puzzle is getting the patient uh, as part of the team. I have a great team. I've got uh, uh, PAs and medical assistants and techs and uh, uh, great nurses in the hospital and the surgery center. But I need the patient, and that means you, to be part of this uh, team. So let's talk briefly here. Uh, again, this is our opening slide. You know, even uh, five years ago, Consumer Reports uh, made it very clear that getting the patient engaged uh, resulted in better outcomes. So we get the patient uh, educated. Uh, we work with modern pain management techniques, which I have uh, several. Uh, and then again, the minimally invasive techniques and the rapid rehab. And looking for the next slide here. Here we go. So objectives of the Swift Path method, uh, you're going to be meeting with me to discuss uh, all your specific labs, go over your x-rays, make sure that we're still moving forward with the right plan uh, with the right patient. We're going to uh, identify what um, uh, things predict success and also what risks you uh, may bring to the table and how we can help uh, make them less. We'll talk about uh, how the surgery may help you and then how the uh, program can help you and well, as well as setting appropriate expectations. I want every single patient to have a coach and I want that coach to be online with you at this time as well as coming into that uh, decision for surgery visit and being available for the first day or two after surgery at minimum. Uh, here you can see it would be helpful if you could have uh, somebody for a week or two but at least uh, one to two days that's for sure. I want the coach to also have direct communication uh, with me and my staff. I want them to help uh, monitor your medicines and the ice and so forth. Make sure that uh, you're following the protocol, getting up as often as you need to, and uh, helping with communication. So the Swift Path uh, joint replacement is really about uh, having Swift Path surgeon, that's me, and then also a dedicated joint replacement center, either my hospital or the surgery center. Most patients are uh, outpatient, going home the same day, uh, and then another percentage of patients go home the next day. The complication rate uh, is definitely lower when 23 hours or less. So ideally, the sooner that you can get out of any facility, the less uh, infection and complication risk uh, you have. I generally do not use inpatient rehabs. Uh, I do not uh, recommend skilled nursing facilities. They uh, have much higher risks of uh, uh, infection, uh, particularly in the time of coronavirus. Of course, we're worried about that in addition to the regular things such as MRSA, uh, C. diff, diarrhea, and so forth. And uh, I really don't like home health services either because they're very inconsistent. I don't know who's uh, going to come to the house and give bad information. So again, uh, I don't like rehab centers. I'm making it very clear. I think if you want to uh, go to a rehab center, perhaps you should uh, think, rethink uh, that uh, by your own outcome uh, and uh, listen to the stuff I'm trying to present. And if you still want to go to a rehab facility, perhaps uh, it might be better that you see a different surgeon that, that doesn't really care uh, so much about your complications. I care. I like having the lowest complication rate in the state, and I want you to have that same low complication rate. So prior to any surgery, every patient needs to fail conservative management. That means you really have to have uh, failed uh, different types of medications, such as the anti-inflammatories, maybe some therapy or exercise, maybe in a pool, maybe changing your lifestyle, maybe some weight loss, uh, maybe uh, using a cane or a walker. Uh, in some cases, like for knees, perhaps some injections. You really should try all of those things first. Those, uh, all of those things have much less risk than surgery. And uh, I know I have my own bad knee and bad hip. And uh, I, I use uh, Tylenol, I use some ibuprofen when it hurts. But I don't have pain five or six or seven days a week. When you have pain five plus days a week and it's not uh, relieved by these different options, then that's when you say, okay, we need to, to meet with Dr. Wickline and really talk about other options. Prior to surgery, I want you to see a therapist. Uh, a therapist can really help you. 
uh, learn how to get around your house, how to make your house safe, uh, and determine uh, what uh, um, uh, different little things that you might need in particular, right? So some patients may need a cane, some patients need a walker, some people may, may need to get some uh, grab bars um, in the steps leading from the garage uh, inside the house. Uh, these are things you don't really think about. And I want that thought about, you know, four to five to six weeks ahead of time. Very hard to get a hold of a contractor to come over and get that done for you. So I want uh, you to consider that and, and get that squared away. I have certain uh, therapists I'd like you to, to work with uh, that understand and agree with my techniques. I have very simple exercises for after surgery and my therapists that I use agree with my methods. So for both hip or knee replacement, you're going to walk uh, once uh, per hour. Uh, you're going to um, do my uh, ankle pumps uh, 10 times per hour. And again, that walking, of course, is just a short walk. Uh, it is, uh, you know, to the kitchen and back, bathroom and back. It is not 16 times around your house. It is not half a mile. That's going to create more swelling and more pain. My knee replacement patients, I've got a couple other exercises, one where I want you to work on the straightening and another where you're going to bend the knee back. Uh, we have a new exercise as well where you, you let your, your, your heel hang up on the ottoman uh, three times a day. And I have a, a video about that on my website. So make sure you see the exercise video. If you haven't seen it, I want you to see it. Uh, if you don't have access at home, you can see it in my office when you're here in the office. Once you've gotten your blood work and uh, seen the therapist, I want you to come in and talk to me. I want to go over your x-rays. I want to make sure that you're having pain five plus days a week. I want to make sure that we identify uh, your specific uh, situation at home and who your coach is, who's going to help and so forth. I want to go over your labs and I want to make sure that you've tried some non-surgical options. Again, surgery has risk. Uh, nobody wants a complication, so you certainly shouldn't have surgery without making sure that you failed uh, some of the simpler things first. So there's essentially uh, three uh, sets of factors that uh, um, we focus on, right? The institutional factors, that means the hospital, the office, and the surgery center. Patient factors, that means your history of blood pressure uh, issues, or maybe your history of, of um Urinary retention, can't get the urine out. For some of my older men, they have trouble with that. Uh, maybe it's frequent UTIs. Again, some of my women uh, typically have some trouble with that as they get older. Uh, sometimes it's a history of previous blood clot. You gotta let me know these things. And then surgeon factors. The surgeon needs to do uh, hundreds and hundreds and thousands of these cases. So again, like we talked about, uh, institution factors. Uh, uh, here's a great quote from Consumer Reports. Sometimes you can be in worse shape coming out than going in, thanks to medical errors and dangerous infections. Again, I'm trying to make it very clear to each of my patients. I want you to create a plan where you can ideally get home the same day, and if not, then the next day for sure. So that means you need to have a dedicated facility, of which I've got two, uh, with a dedicated team, dedicated rooms, and so forth. And that leads to lower complication rates and lower readmission rates. So of course, about myself, caseload, I do about 800 of these a year. That's the most in the entire state of New York. Uh, I've had fellowship training, meaning that I spend an extra year of my life, uh, an additional year of training doing just hip and knee replacement. Um, I have a team approach. I have multiple people that all have specific uh, skill sets to help us. And again, I've created this book that I want you to read and expect you to have read by the time you come to my meeting. Uh, with you prior to surgery so that you can ask good questions and make sure that I'm answering all of uh, your questions um, to your satisfaction. And then I focus really on rapid rehabilitation. As you know, we have a team approach. So I use what's called overlapping rooms. That means that uh, in, as one patient's getting a block and then coming into the room and getting prepped and draped and anesthesia, I'm working on someone else so that uh, we have uh, dedicated people doing each of these uh, pieces of the puzzle. This has led to the lowest complication rate in New York State. So patient factors. Again, uh, patients who are actively involved in their own health care get better outcomes. And uh, importantly, that means you have lower costs. So again, from consumer reports. 
So uh, let's talk about that a little bit. So there are a couple uh, different categories that increase risk. Of course, the older you are, you know, if you're 105 years old, you've got more risk than someone who's 60. You know, if you're overweight, particularly a BMI of greater than 40, that's where your infection risk goes up significantly, and that's why I have a cutoff for that. Uh, even uh, with a BMI of 40, which is my cutoff, your risk of infection is 3.3 times greater uh, than average. So again, I like patients to really pay attention to get uh, their weight and get that weight down. Diabetes, you have to have this under good control. If your uh, sugar uh, goes over 140, every single time that happens, that means you have an independent risk for infection. So ideally, you want to really uh, focus with your doctor and get the, that diabetes under great control. Skin problems, so patients with large uh, plaques on the skin or, or uh, maybe if they have dogs or cats that like to scratch, I want all that uh, skin in that leg to really be cleared up uh, as good as possible prior to surgery. Heart disease, I think we all know about this. Multiple uh, people in the past have had to go to the heart doctor prior to surgery and that happens for at least half of my patients, I would say. Smoking, absolutely no smoking six weeks before surgery or and six weeks after surgery. If you smoke, uh, that leads your infection leads to increased infection risk. Also, uh, causes the implants to loosen, uh, and sometimes we have to do another surgery again because of that. So you have about a three times greater risk. Uh, I will, if you are a smoker, I will test you the day of surgery. Uh, if you're positive, I will cancel the surgery, and unfortunately, I won't let you um, sign back up. So. Once you've committed to, to not smoking, I want you to follow that commitment six weeks before, six weeks after. Kidney disease, super important to let us know if you have a problem with that. That's why I look at those labs. Same thing with liver disease or hepatitis C, history of bleeding problems or blood clots, also important. GI problems, if you have had a gastric bypass or a gastric ulcer, you know, a hole in your stomach where you're bleeding, you gotta let me know. Previous infection or MRSA makes a difference. Narcotic use, this is a real big one. Patients who use narcotics within three months of surgery, of, of my surgery, have a uh, doubled increased risk of complications and needing another surgery. So I want you off of that medication. That stuff uh, is dangerous. You should only use it very sparingly. History of previous surgeries and allergies, high blood pressure, again, a blood clot to the lungs, that's called a pulmonary embolus. You gotta let me know about that. This is super important. I, this is, I believe, on pages six and seven, something like that in my book. Uh, diet makes a huge difference. I like patients to really uh, work on, on uh, again, you see all these greens here. All of these things uh, are going to help reduce your uh, infection risk and reduce your, your swelling, your inflammation. Uh, berries, super important. Uh, I want patients to use protein uh, one week before surgery and at least two weeks afterwards. This is one of the products. The other one is MEND. MEND is the one that has all the studies behind it. Uh, this one is pre-mixed. Uh, I, I don't for sure have a clear um, um, preference for one or the other. They're about the same price. The MEND product is the one that has the six studies specific to total knee showing less infection and uh, less uh, complications. Um, the isopure is just something that my gastric bypass surgeons have uh, uh, taught me about. And again, that's in the book. So I do a number of things to help with this rapid rehab. Um, we do multiple different things to help with pain management. Uh, I have to, you know, I try to clue you in on pain expectations. It's not pain-free. We have the lowest narcotic use in the entire nation for hips and knees but it is not without pain. So I wanna make sure you have appropriate expectations. It's definitely gonna be uncomfortable, it's a surgery. Uh, surgery is kinda of like um, a controlled car accident. So everyone knows if you were in a car accident, you're gonna be pretty darn sore for the next couple of days, if not a week or two. So expect that. You want uh, family support. Um, I do like patients to have uh, uh, one visit with a, a therapist prior to surgery. Uh, I want them to get their home set up correctly, and I want them to understand that blood clot prevention is really up to you. That means you have to get up and walk every hour while you're awake and do those ankle pumps at least 10 per hour. And also, again, if you have trouble getting the urine out, if you're up two and three and four times a night, uh, uh, every night to go to the bathroom, you got to let me know so we can address that. 
So all surgery can have complications. My personal number is 1.1%. Uh, the top 200 hospitals, orthopedic hospitals, is 3.2%. So we're uh, over two times lower, but it's still not zero. So again, every patient's experience will be unique. These are just some of the complications as you see here, bleeding and fractures, infections, uh, dislocation, uh, nerve injuries, and so forth. Uh, one, one leg being longer than the other, medical complications, et cetera. I'm gonna do my best to help prevent those, but I cannot guarantee that you will not get one of those. So one of the biggest things is you, if there's a problem, you think there's an issue, you gotta let me know. If I don't know about it, it's very hard to address uh, or fix. Uh, so again, Understand that uh, this is not 100% uh, uh, foolproof uh, surgery. So again, that's where you make sure that you've had enough pain to understand and accept some of these risks. So blood clot, uh, this is also known as a DVT or deep vein thrombosis. So how do we prevent those? Number one is the decreased surgical time, uh, getting you up more frequently. Uh, and earlier, doing those calf pumps, those ankle pumps, right? Um, and then, of course, the medications and, of course, the technique. So I do a number of things to help prevent uh, pain. We use, of course, the ice is one of the keys, 40 minutes uh, an hour uh, for the first couple of weeks. And just don't give yourself frostbite, of course. Frequently, we use an anti-inflammatory such as Celebrex or Mobic, as well as prednisone, and, uh, which are all prescriptions. We do use a nerve medication. It's, it's probably should have been in a separate category. It's called gabapentin for many patients. We use some Tylenol for many patients. Again, this elevation is key. Um, and then after, uh, if none of those things work, that's when we could talk about these different medications. Oxycodone is the, is the stronger of the two. That one I'm very hesitant to give patients. They have a lot of uh, hallucinations, nausea, vomiting, constipation, uh, and there's a very high addiction risk. If you use this uh, four to six pills over a 24 hour period, you have a 6% risk of being permanently addicted to this junk. So my preference is use tramadol, which has a lower risk of that. So again, here, here, here it is. Even a one day opioid prescription may pose a 6% risk of long-term use, right? This is published from the center's uh, CDC. Everyone's heard of the CDC with coronavirus. Prior to coronavirus, they were all talking about the opioid epidemic. If you use uh, narcotics for 10 days, you have a 20% chance of being addicted to it chronically. So again, it's my goal to not let that happen to you. As you get through surgery, I want you to get rid of those narcotics. This is how kids uh, get a hold of this stuff and then ultimately get addicted uh, to heroin and cocaine and crack. I, I want you to go to the local uh, police station and, uh, and usually most of our police departments now have a drop box to get rid of it. Otherwise you can go to the DEA website. Again, that's listed in the book. We briefly talked about frostbite uh, prevention. You know, the, the key is if, if it's so numb that you can't feel the ice, it, it's good enough. You can take it off for a little while. When you, if you can't feel things, you've, you've numbed it up enough with the ice. So back off on that a little bit, okay? Um, let the skin uh, come back to room temperature throughout the day. Some patients like this cryo cuff uh, because uh, some patient down in New Jersey gave themselves frostbite. Uh, my hospital and facilities here don't want to provide it uh, because they don't want to be sued. So again, you have to use common sense. If you want to use a cryo cuff, you take the risk of uh, getting frostbite. So just don't uh, give yourself frostbite. We talked about this earlier. I really want you to take care of that skin prior to surgery. So uh, again, no scratches up and down the leg. Uh, I'm gonna cancel surgery if I see that, all right? One little scratch, okay, I get it. But but uh, I've seen some, some patients who come to me and they have 50 or 100, you know, that, that cat or dog needs a little discipline, I guess. But you can't have that before surgery. Now, preoperatively, we use this uh, skin prep. Um, it's called chlorhexidine. Make sure that you've gotten, uh, if you receive that from my office, uh, you'll do half of the bottle the night before surgery and half the morning of.
So what to do uh, with the wound care? So for the knees, uh, they're going to have this big ACE wrap. You can remove that at 48 hours. Uh, and then uh, there's going to be this um, silver impregnated big Band-Aid dressing. And that's going to be there for hips and knees. And that you can remove uh, at uh, five days after surgery. Generally, I don't have you use any antibacterial ointments or anything on the surgical incision. Um, once the big uh, ACE wrap is off and the, the pain ball is out for the knees, you can shower. The hips can shower starting the next day. You can get that bandage uh, wet, you know, but no baths or, or hot tubs and so forth. Generally, come into my office at least 10 days, but usually around 12 days to get the uh, wound looked at, get an x-ray, and um, uh, take clips out if we need to. I also, again, I use these minimally invasive techniques, and I also use some numbing medicine inside the joint. So uh, I inject the area around the hip and the knee. Now, sometimes that may, uh, I may numb you up too much, in which case your foot may not work quite right or your thigh may be a little weak. Uh, so go again, go easy for that uh, first uh, 18 hours or so. Um, that uh, can create a little weakness in the leg. Um, we also, for the knees, do a separate pain ball block, and that can last up to five days, typically three to four, but sometimes even as many as five. So again, this is a slide talking about that. The anesthesiologist will place a small, small uh, catheter on the top of the thigh, which will deliver numbing medicine to the knee after surgery. It's smaller than a regular IV catheter. I do want you to know that you'll be discharged home with that. And generally around 24 to 36 hours, about 10% of patients call me and say, hey, I got some leaking. That's normal. You know, you're, we're slowly dripping medicine into the thigh. And after uh, a day or so, or so, uh, maybe a day and a half, you may get some back pressure and you'll get a little bit of a bloody tinged fluid. So again, you may need a few bandages for that, but it's still working. Uh, and uh, uh, you can slow it down if, if you want to slow the rate down on the pain ball. Uh, that may help that problem, but but don't be surprised if that happens. Again, no showering until the pain ball is removed, and then you just remove the catheter uh, yourself at home when the pump is empty. Uh, we'll show you how to do it in the hospital, but it's real simple. This is just a big bandage in, in, pull the bandage off, and almost always the catheter comes right with it. And if not, you just pull on it. It's not, uh, it's just in the thigh very loosely. Now, one of the things and the problems with surgery is you're not walking very much. So it's very easy between anesthesia and not walking very much to get constipated. So I'd like you to drink plenty of fluids after surgery, uh, particularly that protein drink, but in addition, perhaps some sports drinks and juices. If you're diabetic, of course, you know, you, you can't have that extra sugar. I'd like you to limit the narcotic medicines uh, and try to use all the other medicines that we will talk about uh, the decision for surgery visit when you'll meet with me. I want you to get this stuff called Miralax from the pharmacy, and we'll use one cap full a day, uh, beginning the day after surgery. And that generally takes care of the constipation. The fact that we use minimal narcotics, the fact that I ask you to get up and, and get moving right away, that usually gets the GI tract working again. So again, I think uh, this should take care of it for most patients. If not, you give us a call. Now, if you're someone who gets very nauseated or, or unfortunately gets sick to your stomach and vomits after surgery, please let my anesthesiologist know. We generally give lots of medicines prior to surgery to prevent that, but there are a few extra ones we could, could give. So uh, make sure that you let us know, uh, let the anesthesiologist know prior to surgery. Again, if you have trouble getting the urine out, uh, you need to touch base with your regular doctor and most likely meet with a urologist to do your best to get as optimized as possible. Uh, I prefer not to have to give you a catheter after surgery. If you really do have a real bad problem preoperatively before surgery, then I'll give you a catheter before uh, while you're asleep and empty the bladder and that sometimes can help reduce problems. I ask most patients to complete all their dental care about four weeks before surgery, and then I'd like you to wait 12 weeks or three months after surgery. I do ask my patients to take some antibiotics anytime they see the dentist for two years after their hip or knee is replaced. 
We briefly touched on this before, but prior to surgery, you want to remove all those loose area rugs and cords that might cause a fall. Uh, you want to get all the stuff that you think you might need uh, you know, near your, your Barco lounger, your armchair, where you think you're going to stay. Again, make sure those stair rails and banisters are secure. Get some lights in any dark areas where you might walk at night and just remove any clutter that may uh, uh, cause you to fall when you're using a walker or a cane. Lastly, this is important. If you got a crazy uh, uh, pet, um, think about a plan uh, for at least uh, the first week or so. The day of uh, surgery, that's when you're going to meet the anesthesiologist and uh, they'll, of course, register and do all the paperwork. At that point, they will talk to you about whether or not uh, you have a spinal or general. Uh, there's pros and cons to both. Uh, spinal anesthesia, you tend to be a little more awake after uh, surgery because we didn't use the heavy uh, general anesthesia, but sometimes you can have trouble. The ladies can sometimes have a little bit of incontinence where they can lose uh, control of the bladder one time, so bring some extra clothes. And again, sometimes the men uh, can need a catheter because of that. Um, but there's less nausea uh, with spinal. With general anesthesia, there's a little greater risk for nausea, uh, a little more kind of sleepiness or kind of, uh, you know, it takes a little longer to wake up, uh, but there generally is a, a faster uh, time to discharge, meaning you're able to get out of the hospital a little sooner. So I'll leave that up to you and the anesthesiologist to uh, determine. As you can see here, we want some of the nail polish and fake nails removed. Uh, I don't want any shaving of the legs for two to three days prior. And if you have sleep apnea, bring your CPAP machine. You can leave it in the car. Uh, but ideally, uh, if you have it and you have to stay overnight, uh, then you've got it and we can keep you safer. So my Medicare beneficiaries, uh, this is stuff that you need to uh, think about or talk about. Uh, uh, Medicare requires that we talk about this. So you have to uh, make decisions about what you want done in the very rare event that you're unable to speak for yourself. So you have to do, think about this and discuss it with your coach or your loved ones and so forth. Um, the uh, hospital uh, can provide you with those documents or, or my uh, office or the surgery center. But uh, again, it's not 100% necessary that you have to do it, but we are, have been told that we should inform you of these options to uh, think about this and uh, address it ahead of time. Now, I do offer an emergency phone for up to three weeks after surgery so that you can get uh, direct access to my staff. Uh, this is for after hours, the phone number. During the daytime, I want you to call my office and you can ask for my staff. Um, you know, if you call my emergency phone on uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I'm going to be in the operating room and I won't be able to answer it. Uh, so again, uh, call the office during the daytime hours. Um, but otherwise, we, we do have a number for you to reach us. Uh, I would ask you to try to be polite, sometimes calling on Sunday morning at 6 a.m. to uh, tell me that you had a uh, low-grade fever of 99 Saturday afternoon. That's a could have waited to a little later in the day if you wanted to call me and tell me about that instead of 6 a.m. So if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to be at, uh, available to you, but but try to also be somewhat uh, uh, reasonable. So I want you to bring this patient guide with you uh, to every appointment. I want you to bring it the day of surgery. So this way everyone knows on the inside cover what your plan is going to be. And I want you to bring it to your post-op appointment so that if you've got things written down uh, on any of those post-op days, uh, you and I can go over them. I want you to read through all the different documents in the, in the patient guide, all the different pages. I want you to make sure that you think surgery is still right for you. And I want you to write your questions down and bring them to your visit with me so that we can uh, go over them and do our best to uh, answer your questions, make sure that you're ready for surgery uh, and engage in the process. So I appreciate you uh, listening. I know it's kind of dry and I'm not really uh, an amazing uh, speaker when it comes to um, uh, trying to video record yourself on a computer. So I appreciate you staying awake. And uh, again, write your questions down so that the time when you come to meet me after you've read through the book, you've got good questions and I can uh, get you the answers that you need. All right. Have a, a great uh, day and I'm looking forward to seeing you.